right, good morning, church family. It's good to be here with you today. I told the uh, first service it was a little strange to be here today because thus far I identify everybody by what car you drive. I'm like, hey, there's the Toyota pickup. There's Mr. Yaris. Nice to meet you, sir. So uh, just thankful to be in here in the room and see actual people. So um, you just saw a video bumper. We're going to be starting in the book of Mark next week. I've, I've never preached verse by verse through the gospel of Mark, so excited to do that. But as I begin this service, it's Memorial Day weekend. Um, and oh, I don't want to watch that again. There we go. Uh, just I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, take a time just to give us an opportunity to thank the Lord for those who have gone on before us, those who have given their lives in defense of our nation, for our loved ones. So here, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. We have a microphone set down here up front. And if you're watching online, I want to encourage you that you can uh, get on here. I'm actually watching the comments live. I want to give you an opportunity to participate. When we visit uh, the nation of Israel, they have a museum there for Holocaust victims who were, uh, who most of them didn't even have a grave. And so there at this museum called Yad Vashem, it means a place and a name, always 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, they are playing the names of those who passed away during that time period in our world's dark history. And just a name, every five seconds, another name. And that's a way to preserve the memories of those who lost their lives during that time. And so I want you to think back during the past year, go back if you with me, it will, with me back to last Memorial Day. What close friends or family members have you lost in the past year or what military, what are the names of some military members who have lost their lives in defense of our nation uh, within the last year? And then what I wanna do is just give you an opportunity. We'll do the social distancing, give people space if you come down front. If you have a close friend or family member, a loved one, member of the military, you know their name, that you want to come up front and just speak their name into the microphone. And this is our way of thanking God for the life they lived and asking God to give grace to those that they've left behind. So if you will, uh, you can come forward now. And as I'm watching online, if you have a friend or family member close to you, you can type that in now. And, I'll share their name here with our people. Mr. Bevo McCullough. Dr. Robert Hobson. Bebo McCullough. Father, for these lives and the many who have given their lives for us, for Bernard Preston, for Eric Miller, 
for all the names that have been shared with us previously. We do now, therefore, commit those names to you as they enter into their eternal rest. Ask, Lord, for those who have family members that they are still grieving, that your grace be with them, that they know the presence of your peace and trust you as the sovereign Lord who is in control of all things. Nothing happens outside of your timing. Nothing happens outside of your grace. May we trust you and your will and your grace be among us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to have you turn your Bibles, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. Next week we'll start out with Mark chapter 1, verse 1, but I, I wanted to continue, kind of put the book in onto uh, the sermon series that I did recently on the Beatitudes. We're going to do the very next verses. Now, while you're turning there, I want to encourage you, this is your opportunity to be on Facebook during church. I know that's a big taboo. It's like somewhere in the book of Hezekiah. Don't be on social media during worship service. But it's, it's important uh, that Keeping the social media presence online is important during this time. I've got three reasons that I want to share with you why uh, social media is so important right now. One is as obvious from how many people that we've been able to have here during both service. There's a lot of people who still cannot or probably should not attend. They're not here able to join us. So I thank you folks for joining us online. And the thing is, is when we hit share, sometimes can, people can be a little challenged when it comes to finding things, scrolling through, finding the right page. When you hit share, it pops up on your web page or your Facebook profile page, and then other people can easily click on that and watch along with us. Second reason it's important is other than a personal invite, which by far a personal invite, bringing somebody to church is the most important way to invite somebody, most successful way to get somebody to be a part of a church body. They want to know there's someone there that they know. But now what we know from social science, the number two way that someone knows that they should attend a church or might find a church is through some kind of online activity, through some social media. So the number two way that people find a church is through watching online. So I encourage you to go ahead and get that out and hit share. People can join us online. And then number three, and this is the most important one, is every time that you hit share, the word goes forth. Now, we don't know if a thousand people actually watch for, I mean, we, we got numbers and views and stuff like that, but it's really hard to quantify exactly how many people are watching online or what difference it's possibly making. But you know what? Last, Lord, last night, the Lord gave me a perfect uh, sermon illustration for this. Uh, Mike called me and... Uh, and uh, he, he said, man, I, I, or he texted me, he said, man, I need you to call me. And so there's someone who uh, used to attend the church and a few Sunday go, uh, Sundays ago while we were having a parking lot sermon out there. And again, it just felt weird. I'm up on the stage, right? Someone was watching with their dad. And the dad during the service remarked something to the effect of, I think I need to receive Jesus. I don't think that I'm saved. And so accepted Christ right there. And then great news, yesterday, the son who was watching that broadcast with his father, the son got to baptize his dad yesterday as a result of what they watched online, right? So I don't know how that happened. Someday, somebody, someday somebody who hit share that specific Sunday morning, the Lord's going to show you that you were a part of leading that person. It's just amazing. All the tech team, all the work they do, if that's the only story we ever have, it's worth all the work that we put into it. So the gospel goes forth in immeasurable ways. It, the scriptures tell us the word will not come back void. It's always a good investment to put the word out there. There's never going to be a negative return on that. So we always want to do it, okay? Uh, I also want to pause today. I'm not going to bring him on camera, but I've got most of my family today. I'm missing my little girl. She's up in Dayton, Ohio. She took a job as a children's uh, minister at a church up there. And so they're balancing all the how do you do children's ministry during this time. But I have my lovely wife in the house for a service today. This is my first service in the room, my wife's other than like candidate Sunday. And then my firstborn Titus is here. Uh, and uh, he is working in Nashville this summer at a firm downtown. And they've been staying with us this week. And he and his lovely wife, Taylor, uh, they've got an apartment 
real close to Vanderbilt University downtown, and they just moved in there last night. Glad to have them in the Nashville, Middle Tennessee area. And then the famous, the one, the only, Lucas Willis, who is living with us. I'm sure much to his chagrin to a certain effect, all right? So, uh, but he's with us for the summer, and then we'll see what God's going to do in Lucas's life moving forward. So very happy to have them with us, okay? All right, so uh, let, let, let's kick this off, okay? This is kind of like foundational sermon 101, and that's why I had this picture. You know, especially if you're building on the side of a hill, uh, this part's the most important. That's what every builder tells me. If you don't get this, the foundation right, everything else will be wrong, okay? So what we're talking about today is foundational. What we've been talking about for the last few weeks is foundational. And what, what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes is just this concept of what has to be true of us on the inside for us to be a, for, a follower of Christ. And if we truly are followers of Christ, these things will be true of us and they will lead to happiness. You will be blessed. Those, that's why I call them the happy-tudes, okay? And at the end of those, it talks about you can be blessed because you're going to get many rewards. That's the word for great rewards. The word there's polis. That's where we get like the word for polytheism, meaning many gods, okay? You'll get polis, the Greek word, polis rewards. If you're being persecuted, you're just adding up all those rewards that are coming to you if you're being persecuted for Christ's name, for Christ's sake, okay? So that reward, polis rewards are heading your way. But then as Jesus has been focusing on what's going on on the inside of you, today I want to transition with Jesus to what he talks about what's going to happen on the outside of you. Because of what has happened to you on the inside, here is what will be true of you on the outside, living out your life. And this is what he says in verse 13. Emphatically, in the Greek language, it's hard to tell from English exactly how loud this is, but in the Greek language, it's like exclamation point. You are the salt of the earth. Now, this is you plural. So as we would say in the South, if Jesus would have been in, in Tennessee, he would have said, y'all are the salt of the earth. Okay, this is you plural. Y'all are, and then this definite article here, the salt of the earth. Now, if I would introduce you to my wife this morning and say, uh, there's Dee over there, and, and so if one of you would say about my wife, when I introduced and say, yes, that woman over there, that is a wife of Steve, okay? That is a wife of Steve. If you would introduce her that way, what would be your thought? If you heard her introduced that way, what would you think? Where's the other one or other ones, right? Like what kind of crazy preacher did we get here? He, he, does he have more than one life? But if she would, this is the wife of Steve, you would know automatically that she was what? The only wife of Steve. And that, may that be true of me always, okay? All right. So that, that, is, that is the wife of Steve. So when Jesus says you are the salt of the world, it's, it's in the same world as when he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You've heard that before. When Jesus says, I am the, that means he is the only. That's what the definite article means. So because of who you are on the inside, what Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, watch this. He says, you, you all, y'all, the people listening to him, his followers, you all are the salt of the earth. There's no plan B. There's no other group. You're all the world has. You're it. I don't have another group somewhere else that I'm hoping will come through later and fix this. You are the salt of the earth. And he says, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? That's one purpose of salt. It adds flavor to food. And if it loses its favor, what does it say? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under its feet. Now, why would they throw salt out on a path? Okay, um, I'm going to ask you a question here. I, I didn't get any positive responses at the last service. But here in Middle Tennessee, at the beginning of winter, how many of you go out and buy a 50-pound bag of salt 
for when the snow, heavy snow and ice comes, you can throw out on your sidewalk so when people come by, they don't wipe out and break their neck. How many of you go out and buy 50? That's one out of both services, one precautionary man out of all of you, right? But West Virginia, man, you got to go out. We're a little bit further north, right? You got to buy that salt. And that just as I was even leaving, we left the bag of salt at our old house for the next guy. I said, we ain't going to be needing that down there, Lord willing, okay? Because uh, here it may snow, but it's gone in a few hours, right? So, but this is what we do. If you would have that bag of salt left over at the end of the season, if you just leave it in your garage, it'll draw moisture, and then it'll just be one block of salt. And the only thing it's good for is to sit it out, maybe deer lick on it or something like that. But there is another way you could use it. You could take that old salt, and if there's something you want to kill, you want to kill some weeds or a patch of nasty grass or something like that, you would, and people in Tennessee are like, why would you ever kill grass? <laughs> you know, but... You would take that salt and you would pour it on whatever's growing. You could even pour it on the base of a tree. Did you know this? And it will kill that plant life dead. And so that's what they would do. They would throw old salt that wasn't useful for anything else anymore. They would just throw it on the path to keep weeds from growing on that path. And this is Jesus saying, man, if you lose your salt, if you quit doing what God designed you to do, that's all you're good for is to kill things. Kill things off. Okay, but Saul had a greater purpose than that. Um, I got a picture here. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, there was a time when we came home, and I even thought between services that it wasn't that the power went out. I said it's first service. It wasn't that the power went out. What happened is so one of my dear family members unplugged the freezer one time to put plug in something else in our garage and forgot to plug the freezer back in, even though it had all my deer meat in it, okay? And uh, we went away for a few days, and we came back in, and we smelled something. Like, my wife has the nose, like, of the, you know, do you remember the bionic, bionic woman with Lindsay Wagner back in the 80s or whatever? Like, she had magic hearing or bionic hearing. My wife has the bionic nose. She can smell things from miles away. Makes it hard to live with me, all right? So, but anyway. She smelled it. So I, it's out in the garage. So I went out in the garage and I saw that, it, and I knew what it was. And before I opened the freezer, I knew what was about to happen. If, if you've got meat in a freezer and it hasn't been plugged in for days, what's going to happen when I open this? You're going to see this, but before you see it, you're going to what? smell it because that meat has been decaying it's becoming more and more rotten and rancid and when you open it up it's like oh this is awful and this is what jesus is communicating to the church at his time his followers listen you are the salt the major purpose for salt back then wasn't just for taste but it was also to prevent decay the world, Jesus could say it this way, the world is getting worse. It will naturally decay on its own, but you are the salt of the earth. You slow down the decay. In other words, you are the refrigerators of the earth. Maybe nobody's ever called you that before, all right? But you are the refrigerators of the earth. How do we know the world is getting worse? Well. Paul told us it was going to happen. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty and people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, holy. He goes on just with all how the world's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get any better. All the way to he gets down to verse 13, he says, you will have evil people and imposters who will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The world is going to get rotten. And it's not that there are other people, aren't other people out there doing good things. He says, but the hope of the world, the only hope there is to keep it from decaying is you, the church. It's your job to prevent, to slow the decay. It's going to decay, but you want to slow it down. To say it another way, in a way that we're talking about it now, the purpose is, our job is to flatten the curve. It's going to keep getting worse. But listen, if the church is taken out of the way, you're going to have exponential sin. You're going to have exponential decay going on the earth. 
And so what Jesus is saying is, yeah, sin is going to spread throughout the whole world. It's going to get worse over time. But as long as we are out there as salt in the earth, we can slow it down. We can preserve it for a little bit longer to give more time for the Word of God to go forth, change people's lives, ransom them so that they can be in heaven someday. Now, I, you're sitting here this morning saying, man, I'm so glad I came back to church. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and that's the good news of the gospel, right? No, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a good one. Here's a happy one. You, very next verse, you are the light of the world. Same emphatic wording, just like before, the light, you're not a light. You, plural, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. We, we were just moving in, and we had a little lamp, unloading box and stuff. We had a little lamp sitting on the floor. And uh, it was dark in the room, and it's amazing how if you take a lamp that's on the floor and you just sit it up on a desk, how much more light it gives. And this is just what Jesus is saying. It's important to put your light up high where it can be seen so that all the world can see it. This is the purpose of it. Jesus said in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He says, you are the light. Now, how do these two work together? He says, I am the light of the world. We know Jesus is the light of the world. But he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So this is what Jesus does. When he comes into your life, he lightens up your heart. And as you serve others, as you reach out to others, they see the light emanating from you. You are a reflector of God's light onto your heart, and your heart serving goes out to others. It, it's kind of like this, you know, it's like second grade science. The sun lights up the moon. Think of yourselves this way. You are the moon, and you reflect the light of the sun onto the earth. When do you do that? During times of darkness. Paul uses the same type of metaphor in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, in their case, talking about unbelievers, the God of this world, watch this, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're being blinded. It's dark. They're turned away from the light of God. So God is back there shining light, but kind of like the earth in the shadow, the backside of the earth in the shadow of the sun, they are facing away. They're living in darkness. But this is how we reach them by coming around this way. We're going to reflect God's light from our hearts onto them just like the moon. Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. Here's the key. How do we reflect Christ's love to the world? As their servants. That's how we show them we love them, is we serve those who have turned away from God in such a way that his light reflects off of us into their lives. For God says, let light shine out of darkness. It is shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what we talked about last. We blessed are the pure in heart. Why are we blessed? For they shall see God. And just like Moses reflected the glory of God to the people of Israel, so we reflect the glory of Christ Jesus as we look into his faith, as we emanate his lifestyle, and it shines into us, it reflects for all the world to see. So that kind of answers question number one. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light, how do we do that? Steve, how do we do it? Well, number one is this, do good things. It's pretty simple. Serve others. Do good things. Jesus says it this way. It's like the old newsboy song, okay? In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Why do we get do the good things? Not so people will tell us how nice we are or, or how kind we are or so they will like us or give us things, but so they will see that we are reflecting the glory of the Son and give glory to our God who's in heaven. Now, sometimes people, especially in a church context, like, man, I don't know that we want to share that. Like, we don't want people to see what we're doing. We want to do it in secret we, because Jesus says, you know, you shouldn't let your right hand know what your left hand. Here, here's what I want you to watch. This is Matthew 5, 16. Just a couple of paragraphs later, when, right after Jesus say, says, do your good work so that other people can see it, he also says, just a couple paragraphs later, watch this. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. So people look at that and they say, wait a minute. There's no way Jesus has gone schizophrenic here just from here to there in just a couple of paragraphs. What does he mean? Don't let, other, don't let your left hand know. Well, he explains it here in verse 2. Here's the, it's the attitude behind the service doing the good works that he addresses. He says, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Here it is, purpose statement. Why do they do this? Why do they do good things? That they may be praised by others. It's the heart, it's the motive of what. He's not saying, listen, Jesus is saying, do good things and do them in a way that other people will know it. He's telling us to do that. Things like we do, like the fortress ministry, man, we need to talk about that. Whatever this church can do to reach out and make this, to be salt and light in this community, we need to do it and we need to advertise it. But when we do it, make sure we're doing it so that God gets the glory and not so Calvary Baptist Church gets the glory. Not so that individual members get the glory. It's always about for the glory of Christ. So that's number one. Why are we going to do things? Why are we going to get more involved in serving in our community? Why are we going to encourage our small groups to serve and reach out in this community? Ultimately, to bring glory to Christ, okay? To be salt and light in that way. The second way we're going to do it is to teach the Word, okay? One, we serve. The other is we teach. David said it this way, your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet, light to my feet. Now, I don't know about you, but when's the last time you've been walking in the daylight along a path and you got your flashlight out and shown it around? Is that when you use a flashlight? When do you need a light for the path? When? When it's dark outside. And this is what Jesus is saying to, your, to his followers and to us today. Paul says the same thing. Right now is a time of darkness in this world. It's not getting better. We look at the advances we have in science and technology, and you're like, man, this is great. But all it does is enable the wicked among us, the, the sin within us, it enables us to do it more proficiently. I mean, right now what we're talking about, watch this, watch this. Human trafficking, sex trafficking is worse now than it has ever been in the history of the planet. More people are being trafficked now than ever. And it is in large part due to the proliferation of porn online. It's like the more ability we get to do our sinful things, the more we do them with more vigor. And the world's going to get worse and worse. So all that we can do is shine the light of God's Word onto these situations so that those who are walking in darkness can see this is not the path you want to follow. We have to make that case in the public square. And so now this is what I'm going to do. Remember we were talking about still the majority of our people are watching online and 22 minutes in, which I am about right now, almost there, this is about when people start to check out. Here, here's what I want to share with you. Check back in. Get your library card back out, swipe it again, okay? You get all the swipes you want here. Come back in, pay attention for this part, because listen, this is where I'm going into the meat of the sermon, and to get it, you gotta stay a part of the theory here, okay? So here we go, you ready for this? Jesus is the light of the world. We are the light reflecting to him. The word is a part of taking that light to the world. And then Jesus makes this statement next. He says, do not think 
that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Don't think it, not for a second. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Or what did he mean by that? Some people, here's this young 30-year-old new preacher, got all these people following him, and I'm sure that there were many within that crowd who wanted him to say, man, those old Mosaic laws, that was so 1,400 years ago. That's so dated. We need to throw those things out. We need a new word. We need a new message. And this word for abolish means to tear it down and throw it away. And he says, hey, don't think, not for a second, that I've come to tear those things down or throw them away. Referring to the Hebrew scriptures here, what we would call the Old Testament, when he says the law and prophets, usually when those are said together, it means the totality of Genesis 1 to Malachi 4, everything in between, the whole thing. Don't even suppose for a moment that I've come to tear down Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I'm not throwing out the book of Deuteronomy is what he's saying. In fact, not only am I not throwing those out, watch this, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them to fill them up to the full. This is a big deal what he's saying, and it's foundation for everything we're going to do moving forward as a church. He is saying, not only am I not going to abolish them, throw them out, but I am going to fulfill them. He is saying, I am going to be, watch this, watch this. I'm going to be the one, the only one who actually fulfills, lives out, both aspects of the law, which would be the moral aspects of the law, which could be summed up in love the Lord your God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the moral aspect of the Old Testament law. But he's also saying all those Levitical laws, you read about Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Exodus, right? All those ceremonial laws, I'm going to fulfill those two, too. All those ceremonial, sacrificial laws, all those things that the prophets foretold, I'm going to fulfill all those prophecies. I'm going to fulfill all those sacrifices. How did he fulfill the sacrificial laws? He became the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What he's saying is, I'm going to fill this up so full. I'm going to answer all of these prophecies so much so that when I'm done, no priest will ever have to sacrifice another animal again. I mean, the, the word for fulfill literally means, now this is a hard one. If you're getting ready to take your high school students, if you're getting ready to take your SAT, here's the SAT word, fulfill. It's really not. If that's on your SAT test, you're probably not doing well. Okay, here it is. Watch. To fulfill means just fill it up full. To fulfill means to fill it up full. So what Jesus is saying is all those prophecies that are in there, I'm going to fill them up fully complete them. There's not one prophecy, there's not one aspect of the law that I'm not going to keep. In fact, I'm going to overflow it. It's going to be full in you. I'm going to completely fill that up, fulfill it, complete it, take it all the way. Now listen, that's a really bold statement that he's going to fulfill all those things, that he's going to answer everyone, that I'm the only one who could ever do all the moral things that are in there. No one else has ever done it, but I am. That whole Old Testament even says in John chapter 5, verse 39, he says, you sure search the scriptures. And back then, the only scriptures they had to that point were Genesis to Malachi, right? He says, you search your Hebrew scriptures because you think that in them you find eternal life. Well, I got news for you. It is they that bear witness about me. Everything Moses wrote about, everything Isaiah wrote about, everything Jeremiah, Daniel, Malachi, everything all those people wrote about, they all bear witness to me. Now, that's pretty bold, is it not? I mean, the, let, me, let me say it again another way. Sometimes you might joke with your teenager, and you probably shouldn't because it would just provoke anger or whatever. You would say, okay, here you are. Here's the world. You just think the world rotates around you, and that's the way you are. Like, that's not a good parenting technique to do that to somebody, okay, by the way. But here's the deal. Here Jesus is, and here's the universe rotating around him. 
And listen, if Mary or Joseph would have said that to Jesus when he was 13, man, the whole world just revolves around Jesus, they would have been right. It really does. The universe spins around by his word. It is all about him. It is all for him and his glory. And to make that bold of a statement, I'm going to fulfill them all. I'm going to answer everything that every prophet has ever said. It's all about me. It really is. He backs it up with the resurrection by raising himself from the dead. After he rose from the dead, Luke 24, he meets up with some followers of his and he starts going over the scriptures. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, there it is, the Hebrew scriptures, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later in verse 44, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and even throws in the poetry section and the songs must be, there's that word again, filled up to the full. Everything real, written about me, I filled it up to the full. I have done it. I have completed it. The way he said it on the cross was what? It is finished. He goes on in Matthew 5, after he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, for I tell you truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, in other words, forever, not an iota, not a dot, in other words, not the dot of an I, not the cross of the T will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Not anything. I didn't come to put any of that away. Therefore, now watch the connection. Here, here's, here's where you got to put it together. You watch. Therefore, Jesus says, because I'm not setting aside the Hebrew Scriptures, you don't ever want to, let me say it again another way. Because they're all still true, and because the principles of truth in those scriptures will always apply because those principles are based on the character of God. And since God never changes, his character never changes, his moral principles never change, how we apply them today may look differently than what it did back then. But watch, they don't go away. And because I'm not setting them aside, if you are my followers, if you're going to be my salt, my light to the world around you, if you're going to reflect my glory to the world around you, don't miss this. you got to understand it, he says. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, some verse in, in Leviticus, some little thing over here in Hosea, whoever relaxes or just sets aside one of the least of these commandments. Now, it's one thing to say, I'm not going, watch this, watch this. It's one thing for us as Christians to say, you know what, I'm not going to follow that. I don't think it applies to my life. But if, if you add to that and teaches others to do the same, in other words, not only do you not follow what the Scriptures teach us to do, but you tell others, I don't think you need to do it either. You lead other people in that direction. He says, those will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Who will be called the least? It's not the sinners. It's not the prostitutes. It's not the drug dealers. It's not the abusers. Those aren't going to be the ones called the least in the kingdom of heaven. The people who will just be at the bottom of the heap as far as rewards given out in heaven will be those who were pastors and teachers in this life. Pastors and teachers who tell their flock, don't worry about what the Bible says about that. You don't have to follow those scriptures anymore to ignore the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. Those who, listen, I'm not saying that there aren't pastors of churches out there who believe in the resurrection, 
who believe Jesus rose in the dead, who believe in the grace of God, but have a faulty interpretation interpretation of scripture i'm not saying they're not going to get into heaven in fact we see here that there are going to be people in the kingdom of heaven who relax the teaching of god's word and teach others to do the same they are going to make it they're not all false teachers some of them really love jesus they just have a very poor understanding of god's word do you understand the difference they're going to be in heaven but jesus says man the people who ignore those things the teaching of scripture and teach others to do the same they're going to be called the least that's the worst sin that you can commit you will lose more reward over that than any other but then jesus flips it the other side of the coin is a positive he says whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven now don't miss, don't miss this we can't separate belief from practice if i teach them but i don't do them what's that called what do we call someone who teaches somebody to do something but they don't do it in their own life a hypocrite right if i teach them but don't do them i'm a hypocrite but if you want great reward not only will you do what the bible says to do but you will also what teach others to do the same and if you pass on your faith a rightful understanding watch this of the scriptures to others when you pass that down great they will be called great in the kingdom of god moves from least to great you will watch this when you get to heaven there will be those teachers who are the, at the bottom but the ones who teach god's word and live it out they will be called the greatest man what a blessing that's something we all should attain for that's the reward that we all should want that well done good and faithful servant now the word here for great remember last week jesus said great rewards the polis rewards many will go many will go out to the people who have been persecuted you get a lot of them that's not the word here polis is not the greek word here the greek word here is megas like megapolis means huge mega rewards great big the big reward the team mvp will go to those who not only do the word but teach the word okay so help me now as i put this together when jesus says man nothing's going to fade away it all needs to go together this is how practicing our faith and teaching our faith go together this is how we have to grow together as a church we need to deepen in our conviction as to the truth of god's word that we believe every jot and tittle that we believe every dot of the i every cross of the t every word from the first letter in genesis to the last letter in revelation do you understand that we grow in our conviction in that watch this watch this we agree as a church body if this is how the bible says to do it then as a church what that's how we're going to do it do, do you follow that this is foundational if this is how the bible says to do it we're going to do it that way but we're not going to stop there not only are we going to do it we're also going to do what teach it to others teach others to do it as well and in order to be able to live it out those convictions we have to have the character to live out god's word then we increase in our competency our skill of teaching it to others does that make sense you have a conviction that the bible is true from beginning to end you work on your character so that it becomes more like christ living out the truth of god's word and then we all develop in our competency our skill set how do we communicate how do we pass that on how do we disciple others to do that jesus starts out his ministry laying this foundation and then at the end of his earthly ministry he gives us what we call the great commission he says go therefore and make disciples and that is our goal here that's the great commission. it should be the goal of every church is we want to make disciples what are disciples disciples are people who make disciples 
People say, I'm a disciple of Christ. Oh, yeah? Who are you discipling? No. Like, you can't be a disciple. So do that of every one of all people groups. Well, first we're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks. And then you teach them to observe. I don't know what translations you have, but do any of your Bible say most of what he commanded? All that, I, that has been commanded you except the book of Deuteronomy. Does any, any of your Bible say that? Observe all that I've commanded you. To obey all, that is the goal, is to teach it all. Church family, that's where we're going. That's what we have to do. Now, if I could pause here, and it's one of those things like I'm doing this for our church members, and I wouldn't even necessarily make this a part of the sermon for posterity's sake, uh, but imagine there's a little fireplace here, okay? I've got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit inside. Like imagine there's a little fireplace there, and now it's— uh, Fireplace time with Pastor Steve, okay? I'm messing up with the camera, guys. You got me here? So I'm just sitting here with you, and it's just us. So a little pause. Break from the sermon. This is where I've got to share with you, okay? Um, we are in unprecedented times. We all know that, right? No one alive has ever seen anything like what we're dealing with right now, Okay? And, it, and just to put it in a nutshell, just from my own life as I reflect on this, and I haven't, I haven't shared this publicly until now, I'll share it privately just with a handful of people. Um, Keith was part of the search committee over here. Uh, the original plan was Pastor Rick was going to be interim here somewhere till the end of March, early April, and then he was going to start, I think, May 1st down in Florida, the interim pastor. And so I was talking with the committee, and we were trying to tell when's the best time for me to come down there. And, and I didn't even meet with them until the end of January, okay? And so here it is, end of January, we're visiting. And right when I was coming down, Pastor Rick said, I need to get to Florida. I'm quitting a month early. I got to leave town. And they didn't want to have to go through finding another interim, and you got spring break and all that. They said, well, could we get you earlier than the original time we were talking about, you getting down here in April, because my wife had to teach school until the end of May, so I was not in a hurry at all, because I didn't want to be down here and her up in West Virginia. And they said, well, our interim's leaving. Could you possibly come early? We can get you start maybe in April, but in early to start in April when Pastor Rick leaves, we're going to have to get you here earlier. And so we looked at our calendars, and March 1st is when we decided to come. Now, here's what I want to share with you. I just want you to think about this. If Pastor Rick's church in Florida doesn't call and say, we need to get you down here, what's the dominoes? If Pastor Rick's church doesn't call and say, we need you in Florida, we need you to leave early, then I don't come March 1st. And if I don't come March 1st, there is no candidate weekend, and you still don't have a pastor here. Because right after that is when COVID hit and we couldn't meet in groups. You still wouldn't be able to have a full church business meeting and until when? We don't know. How would that have happened? How would I have ever candidated and, met, candidated and met people if COVID would have hit two weeks earlier? You see that? And so I look at the timing of all this and I just say, wow, this is how my life would be different, how Calvary would be different right now. What would it look like if Pastor Rick didn't get that call from Florida as early as he did? And coming into this, now I think back and like, this is a strange situation for me. I've yet to meet the entire body of Calvary. I'm your TV preacher. That's all I am so far. Okay? And so here I am in a time that the church has never seen before, no church has ever seen before. But I do know this, that the weekend that we candidated, there were probably about 400 people in this room. And I remember remarking to my wife, this church, this room was pretty full. And when we went through like the Sunday school hour, the classrooms were pretty full. And I just remember thinking, they don't have room to grow as it is now. They, and honestly, how many of you called me here with the hope that we would have the same or less members three years from now than what we do currently? Like nobody. 
We know the Great Commission. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. That means you need to reach more people, right? And so we were, this is what I want you to see. We were already kind of tapped out space-wise, but now because of the way we have to spread out, and I'm thinking about, and I'm talking with the children's workers, like how are we going to reach more kids? We can't put 20 snotty four-year-olds in a 15 by 15 room. Do y'all understand that? And we can't put 350 snotty adults like yourselves in a room like this right now. We can't do it. So we have no choice but to do what we did, but to go to two services. But here's the thing. When we're able to actually bring kids back and have Sunday school and adults in Sunday school, we can't pack you in 30 adults in a small room. We're not going to be able to do it. So what are we going to have to do? What we've had to do is, hey, we've got to go to two services. But when we go to Sunday school, we're not going to be able to fit everybody into the rooms we have spacing-wise. So what we're going to have to do, we have no choice, is that while church is going on one service, have Sunday school there, and while church is going on the next service, have Sunday, Sunday school classes there. And I've already contacted the Sunday school teachers. I'm having them come over to my house because people are asking, like, how are you going to make that happen? Here's the answer. I don't have any idea. I've never had to live through this before. I don't have the answer. The staff doesn't have the answer. We're thinking through it. That's why I'm having Sunday school teachers. I guess I have some idea, but I don't have the details. Like, I'm not that guy. And so I got to have these people that are leaders of our church come over and our staff, and we're meeting together and we're brainstorming ideas. But I don't know of any way that we can grow and reach more people for Jesus unless we do it this way. And listen, 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 COVID or no COVID, we were going to have to do it anyway because we were out of space. There have been times that you've run more than 400 on Sunday morning, but you haven't done it consistently for, for long. Why? Because the facility's not built for it. Our structure's not built for it. So we got to rethink our structure. we got to rethink the way we do services we got to rethink the way we teach because it's a different time. But listen, COVID or no COVID, we would have had to do it anyway. Okay? So I don't want to end on that. I want to end with even better news that Jesus shares here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus closes with this, and he says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, who were the scribes? They were the lawyers who knew all the details of the Old Testament law. They knew what Leviticus 13 verse 20 says. Now, do any of you know what Leviticus 13 verse 20 says? Can any of you quote it? Like, no, but they would have had it memorized. Unless you do better than the guys that have the whole scriptures memorized and the Pharisees who are the best rule followers of all, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. To which the common man will say, how Jesus cannot follow the rules better than the Pharisees? If that's what Jesus is saying, unless you follow rules better than the Pharisees do, unless you follow it better than the scribes who have the entire thing memorized, unless you do that, you'll never in the kingdom of heaven. Then the common man's going to say what? I can't do it. I'll never be good enough. I've got no chance. And so Paul addresses this concern after the resurrection as to how we can do it. He says, it's not about you doing it. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh. In other words, because of the weakness of our flesh, we couldn't do what the law required us to do. Could not do. Here's how he did it. By sending his own son in the likeness of us, those who are in sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh by his work on the cross. Do you follow? In order that, here's the purpose statement. Why did Jesus die on the cross? This is awesome. That the righteous requirement of the law might be, there's the word, fulfilled in us. This is how we do it. This is why we can do it. It's because of the work that Christ did on the cross. The law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh any longer, 
but according to the Spirit. How does that work? Watch this. Watch, watch, watch. That word fulfill means to fulfill fill it to the full. This is what the Spirit does for us now. We can follow the righteous requirements of the law by our flesh, but by the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes into us and fills us to the full to where God's righteousness reflects and spills all over the world around us. It makes us into salt and light. Do you follow me, church family? So this is what Paul is saying here. This is how we do it. This is your only chance is the Holy Spirit comes inside of you so that you can live out the principles of the Beatitude from the inside out, reflecting the glory of Christ to the world around you, being salt, delaying the decay, but also being light, lighting up the darkness for all the world to see. Calvary Baptist Church family, this is what God has called us to do. To believe every letter of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. To be filled with the Holy Spirit and shine Christ's light to the world around us. We can do it, but only, only by the power of God's Holy Spirit who's filling us even now. Do you want that filling of the Holy Spirit? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I I just want to pray for you right now. Dear Jesus, I just, I want to... Lift up those who are listening, watching online. I want to share with those in the room, if there are any among us right now, Lord, who don't know you as their Savior, who haven't been filled with your Holy Spirit, may you come into their lives right now and enable their hearts to look to the cross to ask for forgiveness, to believe in your resurrection power that can change us from the inside out. Take our sin away. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And may the love that you are shining on our hearts be reflected to the world around us. We pray this in Christ's name.